Hello, thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and you're watching my video on Emily Dickinson's poem, A Bird Came Down the Walk. As always, there's a number of different things we could talk about. I'm only going to raise a few key issues that I think will serve as a guide and framework for you as you develop your own interpretation and reading of the poem. Let me begin by reading the poem. A bird came down the walk. He did not know I saw. He bit an angle worm in halves and ate the fellow raw. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass and then hopped sidewise to the wall to let a beetle pass. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all abroad. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. He stirred his velvet head like one in danger. Cautious, I offered him a crumb and he unrolled his feathers and rode him softer home. Then oars divide the ocean too silver for a seam, or butterflies off banks of noon leap plashless as they swim. As I've said before, one of the most productive ways to approach a poem is to think about it as a dramatic situation with a speaker and a listener. So what's happening in this poem? Well, on its simplest level, someone is describing someone. They're recounting something that happened. A bird came down the walk. This is something that happened. And I saw it. So someone is describing something that they saw, recounting a memory. We might call this an anecdote. Why do we recount anecdotes? Usually because it's something that was amusing or something striking, something that's quite memorable, something that the listener would find interesting that you think the listener would enjoy hearing. So who's the speaker and who's the listener here? We don't really get a lot of information to tell us one way or another, but I don't think it's important. We know it's someone talking about this or perhaps writing about this event that happened to them, that was memorable to them. Perhaps they're writing it to themselves. Perhaps they're writing it in their diary. Or perhaps this is they're recounting it again to someone else. Either way, because the poem doesn't give us really any set information to decide who the speaker or the listener are, and the event itself doesn't seem to concern a relationship between a speaker and listener. This isn't a love poem or an apology or something like that. It's a description of a third event, something outside of the listener's experience, something that happened to the speaker. It's really the way the speaker tries to describe, tries to explain and understand that event that's important, and that's where the relationship is created. So we're still thinking about the poem as a dramatic situation with a speaker and a listener. Here, the speaker and listener's identities aren't so much as important as the nature of the speaker's action. So again, the speaker here is describing something that happened, describing an event, recounting an observation, a memory of theirs, telling this anecdote. Because this poem depicts an act of description where someone is trying to convey what this bird was like, what its actions were like, I'd like us to think about this in the context of our discussion of figurative language, trying to understand how figurative language works. As I've said, figurative language is an attempt to explain, an attempt to understand through an elaborate act of comparison, comparing one thing to another, talking about one thing in terms of another object or another type of object. So in this poem, as the speaker attempts to understand the bird and the bird's actions, we see the speaker going through a series of metaphors, a series of figures, a series of attempts to imagine and understand what the bird is by talking about it through particular language, talking about it in specific ways. The first two lines, a bird came down the walk, he did not know I saw. How is the speaker attempting to understand, or how is the speaker imagining the bird? I think it's important that the speaker says the bird came down the walk, doesn't say flew down, and also by using that word walk suggests the idea of walking. So the bird doesn't seem to be doing anything very bird-like. The bird's not flying. The bird came down the walk, which is an almost human action. You could say a man came down the walk, or a salesperson came down the walk, right? It's not anything particularly bird-like. He did not know I saw. So here the speaker is imagining that the bird had a kind of awareness, a kind of human awareness, that, this, that the bird is aware of people watching it the way a human being might or might not be aware of someone watching it. So I would say that in a sense, the speaker is almost talking about the bird in human-like terms, talking about it 
in the same way that one would talk about a human's actions. A man came down the walk he did not know I saw. That makes just as much sense. It doesn't sound strange to us. So I think at the beginning, there's a certain, if we think, go back to the idea of proximity and distance and, and hierarchy, there's a certain proximity here in that the speaker is imagining the bird to be essentially like the speaker, a person, a being, a living being, just like the speaker that walks around, that lives its life. Next two lines interrupt and sort of upset that picture of the bird as similar to the human. He bit an angle worm in halves and ate the fellow raw. So those are very bird-like actions. An angle worm, which is just another name for an earthworm. Birds eat worms. That's something that a bird would do. It's not something that a human would likely do, bit, uh, to bite an angle worm in half. And he ate it raw. That also is something that separates animals from humans, right? Humans, we cook our food. Animals eat things raw. So th those are phrases that seem to establish a certain distance between the speaker and the bird. That this metaphor that the, the speaker is using, this comparison that the bird is essentially like a human being, doesn't quite work because it does these strange things like biting angle worms in half and eating them raw. At the same time, though, the speaker says, ate the fellow describes the angle worm as a fellow. So, which is again, another word that you might use to describe a human being, a man, as a fellow, a person. So the speaker is still holding on to this idea that the bird is human-like, almost depicting this action of a bird biting the angle worm in half and eating it raw as a meeting between two fellows, two men, two gentlemen on the streets. And this is just an interaction between one fellow and another fellow. So what we've got here is two different comparisons or two different descriptions of the bird kind of warring for themselves in the speaker's mind. On the one hand, the bird as something human-like that comes down the walk and engages and interacts with other fellows like itself. So there's something human-like about the bird. And then also the bird as an animal, as something that bites worms in half and eats them raw. So there's these two different understandings of the bird warring, uh, warring in the speaker's mind in the speaker's language. And so we might think of the rest of the poem or the poem as a whole as the speaker's attempt to come to terms with these different understandings of the bird. What is the bird? Is it like me or not like me? How much like me is it? How unlike me is it? The second stanza continues this duality as the speaker talks about the bird in ways that are both bird-like, that stress its bird-like nature, but also things that make it sound somewhat human. And then he drank a dew from a convenient grass that, and then hopped sidewise to the wall to let a beetle pass. So if we start with the second two lines, actually, hopping sidewise, well, hopping is not necessarily a human action, but moving out of the way to let someone else pass. That's a very human action. We see here the bird being polite stepping over to the wall to let the beetle pass by. And there's perhaps a pun there, beetle, the animal, B-E-E-T-L-E, -E -E, and beetle, B-E-A-D-L-E, -E, which is the name for a minor church official, sometimes an official that was involved in sort of kind of pseudo police duties. So we get the image here of the bird just having done something a little bit improper by biting another fellow in half and eating him, steps aside to let the officer of the church, the officer of the law, pass by very politely. So it seems to be a, an almost human action on behalf of the bird. Another action that the bird takes in this stanza is also something that is both identifiable as human-like, but also non-human, animal-like. The bird drinks. The bird is thirsty. That's something that we can identify with, right? What is the bird drinking? Dew, the condensation of water after the night on the, on the, on the uh, grass, on the ground, or on leaves. And so it's drinking dew from grass. That's a very animal-like activity. At the same time, I think that word grass, I think there's a tendency for readers to see the word glass. You drink from a glass. That's what humans do. We drink from a convenient glass. So I think the speaker there, by using grass gla that suggests the word glass, we see, again, this kind of split between the speaker of trying to understand this bird in their own terms, in human terms, as doing things 
that are like humans, drinking from a convenient glass when it's thirsty, or in the case of the bird, drinking from a convenient grass when it's thirsty, and hopping, moving aside when someone else needs to pass, we step aside, the bird hops aside. So this, again, split, this combination, hybrid between the bird as human and non-human, as something that the speaker can identify with and understand, and that the speaker finds strange and animal-like. Next stanza, as the bird's actions start to become more complicated, the speaker finds their understanding, their metaphorical imagination of what this bird is, becoming more and more mysterious and more and more remote. And the speaker goes through other ways of attempting to understand what this, describe what this bird is and what the bird is doing. The speaker's focus moves in from the bird as a whole to one particular body part, the bird's eyes. He glanced with rapid eyes that hurried all abroad. So the eyes themselves are rapid and the eyes are hurrying all abroad. So we can imagine the bird looking back and forth and back and forth. They looked like frightened beads, I thought. So here the speaker recounting and, and explicitly commenting on what the, the eyes look like, how they imagined the eyes and using a simile like frightened beads. The eyes were like frightened beads. So an explicit comparison as a way to attempt to understand, to explain what the bird's doing, what the movement of its eyes signifies. And the content of this comparison is important as well. The eyes are compared to frightened beads. Well, first off, what are beads? Beads are little bits of jewelry or bits of clothing, their ornaments, their decorations, something that goes on a, a, uh, a piece of clothing, right? But a bead is an inanimate object. Can a bead be frightened? Beads can't be frightened. Inanimate objects don't possess fear. So to whom or to what does this fear actually apply? Is the speaker here imagining that the bird is frightened? Is the speaker seeing fear in the bird's eyes, interpreting the bird's eye movements and rapid movements as a sign of its fear? Is the fear perhaps also on the part of the speaker, a projection of the speaker, of their own fear of this bird or that the bird will leave or some other obscure uh, uh, existential fear that we are not even aware of? Is that what the speaker is seeing in the beads, projecting again their own fear? Finally, what kind of bird has beads for eyes? Do real birds, do living birds have beads for eyes? No, a stuffed bird might have beads for eyes or a toy bird might have beads for eyes, a stuffed animal. So how is the speaker, how is the speaker's understanding of the bird transformed from being something real, something alive to now perhaps something inanimate or something inanimate that has become animate? It's like a doll that is, has come alive. And this image is continued in the final line of the stanza. He stirred his velvet head. So the bird no longer has feathers, but is described as velvet, as a kind of plush fabric. So the bird has now taken on the form of, or has become in the speaker's mind, like a stuffed animal, a toy, a stuffed bird made of velvet with beads for eyes. But at the same time, it's alive. It's animate. There's something about this toy bird that exceeds the speaker's understanding. The speaker uses another simile, like one in danger. And that simile, who is like one in danger? What is like one in danger? It's an ambiguous line, the way it's phrased and the way it's connected to both the line before and the line after. We could read, he stirred his velvet head like one in danger. So the speaker is seeing the, the again, imagining the bird to be afraid, this is an echo of the idea that the eyes are like frightened beads. So the speaker sees the bird stirring its head like one in danger, moving its head as someone who's afraid, who's in danger, would move their head. We could also apply, though, to the speaker themselves. We could read these lines as, like one in danger, cautious, I offered him a crumb. So perhaps the speaker is describing themselves as the one in danger describing just how cautious they were as they extended their hand to offer this crumb to the bird. And why would you be so cautious? Why would you act as though you're in danger? 
giving a crumb to a bird. Well, perhaps you're afraid that the bird might attack you, but you're trying to be gentle. You're trying to be inviting. You don't want to scare the bird away. So describing the speaker's own action as being as cautious as one in danger, offering the bird a crumb, attempting to give the bird something to connect with it. So being cautious in doing so. Response to the speaker's offer, what does the bird do? The bird flies away. But the speaker doesn't just say the bird flies away. Look at the verbs that the speaker uses because it's through those verbs, through the way that the bird's action is described, that we see how the speaker's imagination is unfolding, how their continuing attempt to understand this bird and to describe it transforms. He says, he unrolled his feathers and rode him softer home. What situation do those verbs suggest? When would we talk about unrolling and rowing? Well, it sounds like sailing. This is what a boat would do. A boat rows, a boat has oars or a boat might unroll its sail. You might describe feathers as unrolling, but it seems sort of odd to me to describe feathers as unrolling. It brings to mind to me a sail, or perhaps even a magic carpet, unrolling a magic carpet that you're gonna sit on and fly away. Another uh, perhaps reference, another perhaps imaginary way of understanding this bird's majestic flight. And again, the speaker thinks about it as sailing, as a kind of sailing away flight as a sailing through air. Speaker's final act is to describe, again, attempt to describe the bird and the bird's actions through this, through, through a series of metaphors, first continuing the understanding of the bird as a boat, as like a boat, and then as like butterflies, as other types of animals. So the action of the bird's flight rode himself, rode him softer home then oars divide the ocean to silver for a stream. So we get this image of a softness of the bird's wings, a kind of gentleness. Softer than oars divide the ocean. So the oars gently parting, gently uh, descending into the water and parting the ocean. And the ocean here is described as too silver for a seam. So the ocean itself is so bright, the light perhaps gleaming off the ocean that you can't even see the division in it. There, the, the doesn't seem to be a split in the water where the oar descends into the water. And this brings to mind, I think this is a beautiful characteristic of how beautiful and gentle and soft uh, the bird's flight looks. Because of course, when we see a bird flying, when we see a bird flapping its wings or gliding, we don't see air being divided, but, but that is what the wings are doing. The, the wings are parting the air, but we don't see a seam in the air. It's, it just seems seamless. The bird just seems to be floating. And so this comparison to a boat that seems to be almost floating on the water, that the water does it, the oars don't even seem to be dividing the water. That gives an impression of how, of this, I think a scene of harmony, uh, of, of continuity. And then the speaker moves to their final metaphor, comparing the motion of the bird to butterflies off banks of noon, leap plashless as they swim. So this is a very strange and, and compressed image, and I can't hope to unpack all of it. But first off, butterflies don't swim. Butterflies also fly. So the metaphor, the image of water, the air as ocean, the air as water, um, is continued. So the butterflies are seen as swimming themselves. So we have two metaphors essentially kind of being combined. And the butterflies are leaping off the banks of noon. What are banks of noon? Uh, that seems to be a bank is like the shore, the, the bank of a, of a shore. Noon here being the time, the time of day. Imagining noon as itself an ocean that one leaps off of, leaps off of into the future, leaps off of into the next part of the day, leaps off of into the second half of one's life. And we have this image of a kind of beautiful effortless motion, the butterflies swimming through the air, plashless or splashless. They don't make a sound, they don't make a splash, they don't divide or disturb the air, they don't divide or disturb the water that they're swimming, floating, flying through. So this image of just effortless, beautiful, peaceful motion that almost takes on a kind of religious significance at the end. There's this sense of awe, of wonder, 
especially in that phrase, as the speaker's words become more and more metaphorical, more and more distant from everyday experience, banks of noon, right? Imagining the day itself as an ocean with a shoreline. So the speaker's words become more and more poetic, more and more uh, imaginative, more and more metaphorical as the speaker continues to observe and try to describe this bird and the bird's actions. This raises the question, if the speaker is attempting to describe, to understand, to explain this bird, to communicate what this bird is through these different metaphors and images, these different attempts at understanding it, does the speaker ever actually understand the bird? Does the speaker, is the speaker successful? I suppose the answer to this depends on what you think understanding means. What does it really mean to know or understand something? We have all sorts of scientific ways of measuring and describing the world around us, but do these give us the answer to the essence of things? Does knowing the atomic weight of something tell us what that thing is, what it means, what its purpose is? Individual human beings, we're limited, our knowledge and understanding is limited, in that we can only ever perceive and understand things in relationship to ourselves. We can only understand things as they relate to us. We can only understand each other in relationship to ourselves. So we always have our own perspective that shapes our understanding. See in this poem, the speaker coming back to the me metaphors that they're familiar with in an attempt to understand this bird, this other being, this strange creature, and what it's actions mean. And the more we study, observe, and attempt to understand the things around us, the more mysteries we uncover. Every time we solve one problem or answer one question, we raise a whole host of new questions, new things to discover, new things that we didn't even know that we didn't understand before. This, those people who devote their lives to the study of a subject find that the more they learn, the more familiar they become with the subject, in a sense, the more in awe they are, the more wonder they have about it because they can see the great complexity. They have some sense of just how big the picture is and how much more there is to discover. That as the speaker attempts to understand this bird, attempts to get closer to it, to really describe and understand its actions, at the same time, those actions become more magical, more strange, more wondrous. So the act of understanding also, even though it breeds proximity, it brings you closer to something, it also makes that thing, in some sense, more distant, more amazing, more strange. Ultimately, that's why I think this is a great poem for talking about how metaphor and figurative language work and how poetry and art works. Poetry, art, it's an attempt to understand reality. It is an attempt to reflect on and understand the human experience. But it can only do that by making things strange, by making things different, by comparing our real life experience to something different, something that is not our conventional real life experience. And through that estrangement, through that distance and comparison, we're actually brought closer to our own experience and we're able to understand it more fully. Exactly what figurative language, what metaphor does. It takes one thing, talks about it in terms of another so that you can understand that first thing better. Applies the characteristics, the attributes of some strange other object to something that's familiar and helps you see it anew, understand it anew, see something about it that you didn't see before. So with that, I will end this video presentation. If you have any questions or comments, you know how to get in touch with me. Otherwise, have a good rest of your day and I will see you in the next video.